the harvest field now ripened. There's a work for all to do. Hark, the voice of God is calling to the harvest, calling you. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it and will not forsake his own. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. When the conflict here has ended, and our race on earth is run. He will say, if we are faithful, welcome home. My child, well done. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it. Let's stand one more time. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Sounded like Abigail wanted to start singing too. I was tempted to have him sing it one more time all the way through. and Maybe we'll have him do that in another service again. John chapter number 1. Kind of a simple message this morning. Lord willing. John chapter 1 verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come, baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining, on him the same is he which baptized with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus, Brother Dave Jr., would you pray? Sure. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, to be able to come to church, Lord, and get around the preaching of the Word of God. We ask, Lord, that it just uh, work effectually in each and every one of us that believes here, Lord. Help us to grow, get drawn closer to you, help us to recognize you in the service. We thank you, Lord, for, uh, Lord, the way you've already manifested yourself here in the service. We thank you, Lord, for the children singing, uh, the brothers and sisters' testimonies here. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for being among us, Lord, in a very real and personal way throughout our lives, Lord. Uh, not just in the church service, but uh, from day to day. And uh, Lord, we just ask you to be with the preacher now, Lord. Bless him as he brings forth the word of God. Help us have a good afternoon. We thank you for the good warm weather that you've given us. And uh, Lord, help us not take these things for granted. All the things we have at our fingertips all the time, Lord, not take these things for granted that it's so easy for us to do. Uh, Lord, but to be mindful of you, Lord, to take full advantage of the spiritual uh, benefits and blessings you would have each and every one of us to sort of tap into. Uh, and we just we thank you for all these blessings and everything you do uh, and what you'll do now. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know, so you got to go ahead and be seated. Sadly, verse 31, that is the condition of most people. They know not Jesus. They know not Jesus. It says there, and I knew him not. And then in verse 33, it says again, and I knew him not. And sadly, that's the condition of the unsaved. They don't know Jesus. And sadly, that's a state or a condition of a lot of saved people is they don't know Jesus. 
They know they're saved. They know they're going to heaven when they die. You couldn't talk them out of their salvation necessarily. But they don't know Jesus. They don't know Jesus in an intimate, personal way. They don't know what he's doing. They don't know where he's at. They don't know where he's, when he's coming, if he's coming, how he's coming, why he's going to come. They don't know anything about Jesus at all. They don't understand his love, his mercy, his grace, his judgments, his, his, uh, his heart, his motivation, his spirit, his thoughts, his mind. Uh, they just don't know Jesus. And uh, it's kind of like that, those two guys walking the road to Emmaus there. They're walking with Jesus, but they didn't know who he was. And it wasn't until he touched them in, a, in an intimate, personal way, spiritually speaking, that uh, their eyes were open. And unless God does that for you, uh, you're never going to know Jesus. You're never going to know him the way he wants to be known uh, unless, uh, unless uh, he touches you, uh, spiritually speaking, touches your, your eyes and touches your heart. Uh, now, the reason why they got touched there was because they were walking with Jesus. Amen. You see that thing there? That's kind of the key. You may not know a whole lot about the Lord or what's going on or what to do, but if you'll just walk... <laughs> If you just put two, one leg in front of the other and just walk, uh, God will show up. God will yeah. touch your heart. Just be faithful to walk. Amen. Take the steps necessary uh, to know the Lord. And uh, I feel bad for this church age that we're in, the end of the church age, because a lot of folks just can quit walking. Yeah. They just quit walking with God. They quit walking to church, quit walking through their Bibles, walking with the Lord in prayer, right. walking with their brethren, walking... Uh, to, to take care of anything or take care of anybody. They're just, they're just giving up, altogether giving up. And God can't deal with somebody. God can't touch you if you've just given up. And uh, I don't want to be a church that we've just given up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love the testimonies this morning. I was just thinking as he was praying there, and I joked about it, that how, uh, you know, whether or not he paid him to do the work, you know, to print out the stuff, it seems like God paid him back. Yeah, amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was he doing yesterday? He's printing a bunch of books. Yeah. 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 Are you with me? Is that yeah. what we're talking about? Because you don't know Jesus. Right. He's printing a bunch of books because he printed a bunch of stuff so that people might know Jesus. Right. He gave up of his time. He gave up of his resources, his ink, yeah. to print a bunch of Bible-believing broadcasts that can be passed out. And he might not have got paid for it physically, but God says, I'll take care of you on the back end. Amen. Just be faithful to do what God allows you to do. Amen. What's going to cost me too much? You might not be able to afford it. You can't afford not to. Right. Did, you not, did you miss the kid's song? Little as much when God is in it. Amen. Labor not for wealth or fame. Amen. Too many Christians only do, will only do stuff if it gets them recognition yeah, or fame right. or fortune. Yeah. That's it. Right. They're charismatic in that way. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Oh, if I give my dime, God's got to give me a hundred bucks. No, we no. don't. Especially not if you give with that attitude. Yeah. I know Steve. Steve don't do anything expecting anything in return. Yeah. He just does it because he loves to help. He loves to be a friend or a yeah. brother yeah. or it's on God's behalf. It don't matter what it's for. He doesn't do it for the reasons that which most Christians do things, and that is to be seen of men. He yeah. didn't tell me to say all this. It's more like in the message. Yeah. You can see the outline afterwards. <laughs> But it's about walking with the Lord. Now, what I like there, it says there that, um, it says there in verse 36, and looking upon Jesus as he walked. Mm -hmm. Looking upon Jesus as he walked. That's the kind of thought that struck me as peculiar this week. Mm -hmm. There's something profound and very practical about the thought of watching Jesus walk around. Yeah. <gasps> Imagine that. That's just Jesus walking around. Like, oh, there's Jesus over there walking around, you know. And uh, it is, it, I had to go online to see, is there anything about uh, the, the distance in which God might have walked, uh, how much God might have walked the planet? Is there any, they didn't have Fitbits or Apple Watches to track. Uh, but is there anything that says about how much maybe Jesus walked in his lifetime? And it is estimated that he walked over 3,000 miles from the point of his baptism here to the day of his death. Now that doesn't include his, his early years, or like his childhood years, where he's running around everywhere. Mary Joseph can't keep up with him. He's all over the place. But from three, but and it walked over 3,000 miles from the period of his baptism to the period of his death. Over the entire length of his lifetime, it is said that he averaged about 20 miles a day. So it's no wonder we read here of Jesus' sleep. We read about in the Bible about how Jesus slept or got hungry 
or had to go somewhere by himself to pray. He was a tired man, no doubt about it. He got hungry because of all the walking he did. They didn't have Uber. They didn't have Lyft. They didn't have the yellow taxi cabs. They didn't have Schick, uh, what do they call those things, rickshaws. They didn't have that kind of, he had to walk everywhere you went. Some have estimated that he walked as much as 21,000 miles during his whole lifetime. 21,000 miles during his whole lifetime. Well, John had his eyes on the right place and on the right person at the right yeah. time. John had his eyes on the right person at the right place at the right time Amen. to be able to see Jesus walking. Something else I, I thought is interesting. Look back at verse third, uh, verse uh, 29. It says there in verse 29, that the next day John sees Jesus coming at him and saying, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world, period. As a matter of fact, right? A period a, a, a it's, a, it's a statement. It's a true statement. It's just simply declaring what is so. Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Fact. Period. But look at verse 36, the next day. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God! Exclamation point. Isn't that a wild thought? At least it's wild to me anyways. There's an old sitcom that in the sitcom they made a big deal about exclamation points, using them too much or too little. Well, God doesn't go out of the way to use his exclamation points. Let me just say that. A lot of the punctuation in the Bible is a period or a question mark. But here is an exclamation point. And I think the difference is, is there's, a, there's the matter of fact is I'm saved. Behold the Lamb of God which took away my sin. Fact. But the next day after salvation, there's, a, there's a something about Getting to know Jesus after you're saved, where you're just like, Behold the Lamb of God! Amen. Look at what Jesus has done! Amen. Look at what Jesus has given me! Look at all the blessings! Look at all that God has brought me through! Listen to what God has done! Just behold the Lamb of God! Amen. Exclamation point! Yeah. Yeah. And that is a matter of not just fact, but a matter of just praising God giving him honor and glory and recognition for not just being the one that saves me, but for the one who walks with me, Amen. the one who keeps me by his, by, uh, by his side, the one who uh, keeps me by his grace uh, walking in this Christian life. Amen. It's a continuous exhortation for Christians to behold and look at Jesus. He doesn't want it just to be this one time and done thing. A Christian's life should be a continuous, exclamatory uh, life of there is Jesus. Amen. Now, as Christians, we tend to think that we can handle everything that comes our way. That's how we are as Christians. As Americans, I can handle it. I got this. We tend to think that we can handle everything that comes our way. We have great confidence that everything is going to be all right. Because we know Romans 8.28. Right, we've got that one memorized. All things work together for good, right? So, as Christians, we know that all things are working together for good. So that gives us great confidence and assurance that everything's going to be all right. And, uh, or you go over to Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. And you say, whether by death or by rapture, everything's going to be all right. <coughs> as a matter of fact, it's all going to be all right. Whether by death or by rapture or by God solving my problems, Romans 8, 28, everything's just going to turn out okay. And, and that's true. And I'm happy that's true. But unfortunately, this has left some Christians with a false sense of security. That they, they've taken their eyes off of Jesus and just said, well, everything's going to be alright anyway, so... And we'll get through it one way or another. And then they get through it, but they don't ever look to see what God did to get them through it. Yeah, amen. They just know they're on the other side of the thing, but they never look back and say, Behold, amen. what God brought me through. Yeah, amen. And they, they just have forgotten what kind of a mess they were in to begin with, yeah. and what kind of a great peace and rest they have now that they're on the other side, but they just quote Romans 8, 28 as if that's the way things should have gone. Yeah. Without ever saying, Jesus, you brought me through yeah. that. Jesus, all things work together because of you being good. Not just because I'm saved. Not just because that's the promise to the Christian, but because God, Lord Jesus, you are good. Amen. You are what makes this thing true. It's not 
doctrine, it's not medicine, it's not science, it's not strength. It's you, Lord. I think as Christians, we've taken our eyes off the Lord. And so we've lost the excavation point. <laughs> we've got the period, sure. Death, rapture, Romans 8, 28, matter of fact. But we've lost the exclamation point in our life. And God says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Yes. You need to lift up Jesus, folks. Amen. Every opportunity, every chance you get, every second, every minute, every moment of every day, if there's an opportunity to lift up Jesus, you know what you need to do? Lift them up. Amen. Now, I know you don't always feel like it. And maybe in the moment you won't. But on the other side of not feeling like it, you know what you should do? You should look back and lift up Jesus. Amen. And that's what John is doing. He's seeing Jesus walking. Yeah. He saw him once before already, period. Then the next day he sees him walking and he's like, that's the guy. Yeah, that's yeah. the guy. <laughs> Look at Roman, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20 for a second. In my daily Bible reading, I came across this verse and I thought, how fitting in the Old Testament. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And look at verse 12. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Yeah, you know, there's going to come times in the Christian life where you will be overwhelmed yeah. by your circumstances. Yeah. 100% completely overwhelmed by all that is going on in your life. Yeah. And it might only be one thing going on, but that one thing is enough to overwhelm you. Or it's a, a bunch of little things <laughs> that come to overwhelm you. And you know what? You're not going to know what to do. Oh, I know you know Romans 8, 28 is in the Bible. But you don't know what to do in the midst of the circumstance you find yourself. You find yourself like they found themselves here. Lord, we just don't know what to do. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians don't want to say that. They always want to know what to do. They always think they know what to do. We'll figure it out. We'll make a way. We've got this. Don't worry about it. We're, we're good. You need to get to the place where, or you will get to the place where you don't know what to do. And that's the place where you need to do one thing and one thing only. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Amen. When you don't know what to do, you've only got one thing you can do. That's <laughs> it. Amen. Look upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Thank God that we can. Yeah, brother. Amen. And the only reason why you can know to do that and have assurance to do that is because he is the Lamb of God which took away your sin. Amen. Yep. And so when you find yourself overwhelmed... And you will, if you haven't yet in life, you will at some point become overwhelmed by something. Amen. And you will not know what to do or how to handle a certain situation. Yep. And even if you tried, you're not going to have any success. And you're going to feel less, you're going to feel more stressed and more overwhelmed <laughs> that you can't solve it. Amen. And it's at that point you need to stop trying. And just say, our eyes are upon thee, O yep. Lord. So this morning, I want to encourage you to keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. That's the encouragement this morning, is to keep your eyes on Jesus. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12. You know what happens if you don't, right? Peter, he sank. He got overwhelmed. And he sank. Now, I thank God that in the midst of our sinkings, in the midst of our eyes not being on him, he never leaves nor forsake us. Amen. But I think that as Peter was going down, what did he say? He said, Lord, save me. Yeah, amen. You know what I think Peter was doing as he was going down for the last time? I think he turned his eyes upon Jesus and he said, Lord, save me. Yeah, amen. I think God would let him go all the way down yeah. to the depths of the sea until he cried out, Lord, yeah. save me. Yeah. My children. Because he was going down. Yeah. And his only recourse was to have the Lord Jesus Christ lift him out. But he needed to ask for it. Yeah. 
He might have been flailing and doggy paddling and trying to do everything, but it just got to be too much. And he realized, you're it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1. Wherefore, see we also are compassed. That's overwhelmed. That's overcome. That's surrounded. We're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Here it is. Yeah. Looking unto Jesus, yeah. the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yeah. There's the encouragement. There's the exhortation. When you're compassed about by so cloud of witnesses, compassed about with trials and tribulations and struggles and difficulties and uncertainties, you've got one option and one option only if you want to get out of it. Yeah. Look at Jesus. Yeah. I also believe that as you're going through what you're going through, you know what other people are doing? They're looking at you. Yes. While you're going through all of the overwhelming stuff you've got to put up with and deal with, there are other people who are going through similar things or will go through, and they're looking upon you to see how you're going to handle it. And if they see that you're looking upon Jesus, it tells them, wait a second, if I get into a spot like they're in, you know what I need to do? The same thing they're doing. Right. Look upon Jesus. Amen. Yeah. See, why would I look upon Jesus? Well, he's the source of our faith. Amen. Jesus is the source of our faith. Amen. Look at the verse. Verse 2. Looking unto Jesus. Why? Because he's the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the ending. Right. Yeah. He is the source of our faith. And can I just say this? This is the source of your faith. Amen. The way you look upon Jesus isn't just looking up at the sky like, you know, some religions might teach out there. It's to look upon Jesus through the word of God yeah. because he's the author and the finisher. The finisher is the one who puts the finishing touches on an object. Yes. The last thing before it gets put on the shelf is it gets shined up. God put the shining image upon the King James Bible. Amen. And so we look upon Jesus by looking into the word of God. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is the source of your faith. Amen. So we look here as the author and finisher of our faith. Number two, we look upon the Savior because he's the example for our suffering. Right. He's the source of our faith, but he's the example of our suffering. Look at the verse again. It says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Jesus Christ endured the cross. He is the example for our suffering. He shows us that you can endure the cross. You can endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Yes, it's overwhelming. Yes, there's trials. Yes, there's tribulations. Yes, there's compass and things all about us. But as Christ endured the cross, he, our example, says we too can endure the cross. And then lastly, he is the hope for our future. Amen. <laughs> Look what it says there. It says he is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He's the hope for our future. Amen. He's the source of our faith, the word of God. Yeah. He's the example of our suffering, the cross. Right. And if you preach the cross, you're going to suffer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he's the hope for our future. Amen. We recognize that one day... Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18 is true. Yeah. <laughs> the day Christ shall rise first. That's right. And that we which are alive and reign. <laughs> That's the hope for our future. Our hope for our future is that one day he's going to come and deliver us out of this present evil world. It's what's called a blessed hope. Amen. That one day we're walking along streets of asphalt to the street of glory. Amen. To the street of gold one day is where we're going. That hey, one day I'm going from a wheelchair and crutches to skipping and leaping on, on, on mountains and hills and valleys yeah. Yeah. where there's no curse, no death, no stones to trip and stumble on, no cracks, no crevices, no hole that somebody dug and left it for some strange reason. <laughs> we were at a dog park this week. <sighs> Dog parks, man. 
My daughter had been asking for about two years to go to a dog park. Finally caved in and went to a dog park. I said, this is why I don't go to dog parks. All the other crazy dogs were one. And then all the chit-chat about each other's dogs, number two. Yeah. And then all the holes the dogs dig. Uh, you know what I'm saying? They, have, they got holes everywhere. Hmm. You try to walk and not, and they don't, they, don't, they don't fill back in when they're done. They just leave the hole. The next dog goes, oh, the hole. Yeah, yeah. They just make the hole. big got crater over there. You got to watch out for it. Dog park, sure. But, uh, hey, man, I don't know if there's a doggy park in heaven or not. <laughs> But if, they, if there's a dog park in heaven, there's no holes in it. No, yeah. there was no grass in this dog park. They chewed up all the grass, you know, between the between all the the pee and all the poo and all the oh, yeah. running around. There's, there's just dirt, just yeah. a cloud of dust kicking up everywhere. You're like, oh. yeah. And you got their dog trying to, you know, take out your dog. You got dogs this big. My dog's oh, yeah. you know, this big, you know. And, yeah. <laughs> crazy stuff. Yeah. I don't know. I know there's things in heaven that uh, probably aren't even in the Bible. Yeah, you know. There's probably left some things out just to yeah. catch us off guard when we yeah. get up there. Maybe there's maybe it's all that maybe it's all here. I just ain't seen it all yet, you know. Right. I know there's horses up there. I'm sure God's got a zoo up there of some kind. Yeah. There's yeah. lions, yeah. tigers, yeah. and bears. Oh my! <clears throat> oh, it's not. Oh my! It's amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. amen. That's our hope for the future. Yes, it is. This yeah. world is not my home just passing through. Yes, right. yeah. My treasure laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. My hope is not in the midterm. Yeah. It's not in 2020, whatever the next election is, yeah. 24, yeah. whatever that is. My hope is in the Lord Jesus. It's the blessed hope yeah. of God. Yeah. And it says that, he says, I, where I go, there he may be also. No. But where did he go? He went and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Now I know that I probably won't be seated right there in that type of way, though I'm seated in Christ in heavenly places. So in a way, I'm seated there. I'm sure I'm not getting front row seats, but I'm going to heaven. Amen. And I'm going to sit with my Lord and Savior. Amen. And we're going to have a wedding. And we're going to have a marriage supper of the Lamb. And then we're coming back for a thousand year millennial reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we're going out into eternity. That lasts however long eternity is. Amen. That's my hope for the future. So what do I keep my eyes? I keep my eyes on him. Amen. I don't keep my eyes on the problem. No. I keep my eyes on the prize. Amen. Press towards the mark for the prize of the high God and God in Christ Jesus. Amen. We're all going to have problems. We're all going to have sicknesses and illnesses and diseases. We're all going to break down and wear out and give out. And we are all going to be the most miserable if it weren't for the truth that Jesus is coming, yeah, yeah. and we can with a great exclamation say, Behold the Lamb of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we can say. Yeah. This world's not going to get better and better yeah. and better until right. we figure out how to get yeah. Jesus to come back. It will get worse, and it will get worse. Right. Even if there's plenty, the sin will still get worse. Yep. Right. And so the spiritual warfare will get worse, right. yep. and the mental uh, uh, anguish of Christians will get worse. And so it'll be harder to walk with the Lord and to keep your heart right with God unless you keep your eyes on God. Amen. That's why he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And then it says, for the joy that was set before him. Yeah. He wasn't miserable. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Jesus was not a miserable human yeah. being. Amen. This world is filled with miserable people. Amen. And Christians even are miserable. Yeah, right. The guy at the dog park I was talking with, his wife was asking him what they wanted, what he wanted for dinner. And he just said, I'm just tired of eating. I'm just tired of food. Why? It's miserable. Well, because you have it all already. There's nothing out there that you probably haven't tried already. You know, what new idea can they come up with the food? You know what he said? I wish I could just take a pill. That would... You know, give me all the substance that I need, and I ain't got to worry about sitting at a meal and cutting it and ordering it, waiting for it to come, and all that. People are miserable. Yes. Wow. And sadly, and sadly, there's a lot of Christians that are that way as well. If I could just take a pill to be a Christian, yeah. A lot of Christians don't want to go through the. Uh, a lot of Christians don't want to go through what it takes to get filled up spiritually. They want to take a spiritual pill. Just give me the quick version of being a Christian. Yeah, right. There is no quick shortcut to being a Christian. No, the Christian life, as I preached about last week, 
that you might walk worthy of the vocation, that you might walk worthy of the of the, of the kingdom of God. The Christian life is a walk. And you will not walk worthy or walk pleasing or walk according to His will if you don't keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. That's the only way you're going to walk. Right. And if you try to walk, you're going to walk miserably. Yeah. And Jesus Christ walked with joy Amen. even as He walked up to the cross. Right. I thought about the life of Jesus Christ and I took it out of the message, but of all the places He walked, yeah. He walked up to the cross yeah. carrying the cross. He walked up to Golgotha Hill, carrying a cross with him. Right. But it didn't stop there. That's right. He walked out of a tomb. Right. <laughs> he walked, the whole love of God. Amen. He walked out of a tomb. Yes. One day I'm going to walk out of a tomb. Amen. Whether it be a tomb of this body or the tomb of that grave, I'm walking out of a tomb. Amen. And that's what gives me great blessed hope Amen. and great blessed assurance. Amen. But that only comes if we'll keep our eyes yeah, upon yeah, Jesus Amen. and turn our eyes upon Jesus and look upon the Savior. Amen. Look upon the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Look upon the Scriptures, which is the Word of Amen. God. Amen. And you'll be able to walk with joy Amen. until He comes and gets us. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray you bless the message this morning.